In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Now, for today's Chaplain's Report, we're going to be in the early part of the book of 1 Samuel. To give you a, a little bit of background, whenever we think of the book of Samuel, we usually think of a couple of things. We think of Samuel, and we think of David. And to be honest, that's what I think of whenever I think of the book of Samuel, too, because the book centers around those two characters, the life of David and the life of Samuel. So there's nothing wrong with that being the first thing that we associate, but sometimes I think we gloss over and overlook a really important and very telling story that Samuel is a character in, but he's not the main character that the book really starts out with. Because, of course, the whole book at the beginning sort of centers around Samuel's birth and him becoming a priest. But there's another character in there that we don't really talk about all that often, a priest and a prophet named Eli. And God was very, very angry with Eli's sons because Eli, he was a pretty just devout person and he's actually spoken of pretty highly in certain portions of the scripture here in the early parts of 1 Samuel. He, he's actually a pretty good guy except for one major flaw that he has and it's not him, which seems unfair. It's his sons. His sons, who are also Levites and priests, you see, they do a whole bunch of things that they shouldn't be doing, and it pretty much all centers around the fact that they take advantage of both their family and their position as Levites. So being of the tribe of Levi and also being in a position of leadership, being priest of God, they take advantage of that. So a couple of things that it describes here, just to give you sort of a taste of the kind of things that they were doing is while they were involved in their priestly duties, um, there was a tradition where you would basically, when a uh, offering was being determined, that you would scoop out with a fork whatever meat was going to be the, the portion for the priest because, you know, priests work in the temple and so they don't farm or ranch and they don't produce the food themselves. They take a small portion of the offering to God to provide for themselves, kind of like the way that in modern churches, preachers will take a, a salary that is a small portion of the offering that is given to God. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but it's kind of close and it helps us as modern readers understand this. And so they would take, uh, so it would be pure chance and not something that they were intentionally taking the best cut of meat or the, the cut of meat that they preferred the most or the biggest cut of meat. They did it at random, so they would just scoop in with a meat hook and bring out, and whatever they brought out with the meat hook completely at random because they couldn't see the meat when they were doing this, that was their portion. They were doing this practice to where they were specifically taking the biggest cut of meat, the best cut of meat, and another thing, which was even worse, is they were also taking advantage of people that were coming to worship God. They were taking advantage of them with their sacrifices, and what's really horrific is they were taking the young women that came to worship God and basically having their way with them sexually. So there was a lot of really horrible things that was going on, and these people were abusing their position as people who were supposed to be representatives of God and taking advantage of people that sincerely wanted to worship God there in Israel, which is something that is pretty consistent through Scripture, that God obviously can be wrathful about a good number of things if you defy His will or disobey or rebel against Him. There's very few things that God's going to get more angry about uh, at you than taking advantage of him when you're supposed to be representing him. You remember that the one time we have recorded in the Gospels where Jesus was angry was when people were essentially doing the same thing in Israel, where people were taking advantage of and extorting people that were there to worship God. And so this is not something that God takes lightly, and we see that 
really, uh, this is the reason that God is angry with Eli, even though it's his sons that are doing this. And you'll see the reason why here in 1 Samuel 2, verse 29, where he says, and this is God speaking through a prophet to Eli, Why do you kick my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me? But making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel. So, even though this wasn't something that, as far as we can tell, Eli was doing himself, God was very angry at him for allowing his sons to do so. Now, he had rebuked his sons, he had told his sons not to do this kind of stuff, but basically it was like, a, no, 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 don't do this. And that was the end of it. There was no punishment, there was no. Uh, actual going out and punishing them or keeping them from doing this. It was basically like Eli told them to stop, and that was about the end of it, but they just kept doing whatever they were doing anyway. And so I think that the really telling phrase in that verse is you honor your sons above me. In other words, even though it's a good thing to love your children, and even though God wants parents to love their children, He doesn't want them to love their children at his expense. If it becomes a choice between loving your children and loving God, you're supposed to be obedient to God first, and your children take a distant second. And by the way, that's not exclusive to parents and children. It's that way with anybody, any of our human relationships. We're commanded to love other people. We're commanded to be compassionate, to be involved in their lives as, as much as we can, at least in a positive way, to try to help anybody that, that asks of us. I mean, you could go on and on and on about the commands that we're given and, and the advice and instruction that we're given to love other people. But ultimately, any time that love of somebody else becomes an obstacle to obeying God, then we've got to stop. Because if there's anything in this world, anyone in this world, that we love more than God, that's putting somebody else, a human, on God's throne. That is putting a human being above God. God will not accept that, and shouldn't. There should be nobody that has to compete for God's throne in our hearts. And Eli loved God. Probably a lot, but not as much as he loved his sons. And that's something that God simply would not tolerate. He would not tolerate him because of his not wanting to chastise his sons or not wanting to stop them from doing what they were doing. He would not tolerate Eli putting his son's wants and his son's feelings above his own. Ultimately, he could not put God first in his heart, and that's something that God would not tolerate. And so we see a little bit later, in in fact, in the next chapter, sort of a follow-up to this to give us more insight. In 1 Samuel, um, yeah, that's that's the same verse. Okay, okay, I've got it now. So, sorry, the, uh, the title there is wrong but it's supposed to be 1 Samuel 3, 13, and 14, which states, For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by the sacrifice or offering forever. So, first of all, we get a little bit more insight in there because it tells us specifically that Eli refused to rebuke his sons. That he would not stop them from doing their evil practices. And that's why Eli was accountable for their sins. The Bible and the Torah specifically, the law of Moses, is very clear that fathers are not held accountable for the actions of their sons unless... They fail in their fatherly duties to rebuke them and to stop them. Now, if 
your child goes out and does something and, and you've tried to your dead level best to stop them and, and teach them the right way and they just go on and big fat do it anyway, that's not on you. But that's not what was going on here. Eli had told them to stop, but it was just kind of a, oh no, please stop. And that was about it. He told them to knock it off, but ultimately he didn't put his foot down. He didn't kick them out of the priesthood. He did not discipline them the way he would have anybody else in Israel because they were his sons. And Eli was wrong for doing that. Because to him, his sons and their feelings were more important than obeying God. And that's why Eli paid a steep price for what he did. Now, if you read the rest of the story, it continues on that both of his sons were slain and he actually winds up dying on the very same day. What God promised, what God said that his house would be cut off and not have an heir, did in fact come to fruition. His household was destroyed because of this. Why would God come down so hard on this family? Why is it that he decided that this was something that was so intolerable that he had to snuff them out? Ultimately, I think it was because he had to set an example. That if you're going to be a representative of me, if you're going to be charged with showing other people what I am and who I am, and you use that as an opportunity to abuse people and take advantage of them for your own personal gain, I'm not tolerating that. God is a very merciful being. He is long-suffering. He has patience with people. But he has no tolerance for that. And I think the reason that he doesn't is he doesn't want people coming, seeking God, seeking him, wanting to know him better, to come across somebody that claims to be a person of God, that is indeed doing the exact opposite of what God wants, would be showing them a picture of God that is the exact opposite of who God really is. That's something pagan religions and heathens of that time did, where priests to their pagan gods would take of the different virgins of the towns or take advantage of people and, and basically extort them and rob them and, and take... Uh, temple taxes, and all kinds of other things. That's not who God was, and that is not what he wanted the world to think that he was. That's why he got so upset with them. And I think that that's a sobering reminder to us, because remember, we're priests. According to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, all those that are members of the church are priests ourselves, which means we're held to exactly the same standard we have the exact same responsibility to show who God is to the world. And if we put out a picture of God that is as distorted as Eli's sons, you better believe we'll share in a fate just as bad, if not worse. God was extra hard on them because they held a higher responsibility as people that were supposed to know better and to show God's will and his love and his compassion to other people, and they failed to do so. And if we, as modern Christians, do the same, because we are priests of the kingdom of heaven, ultimately, God is going to cut us off from the church just as he cut off Eli from the children of Israel. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.